On December 26, 2004, a magnitude 9.1 earthquake hit off the coast of northern Sumatra, Indonesia. The earthquake was the third largest ever recorded, lasting nearly 10 minutes and raised tsunamis up to 100 feet high. Along the coasts of the Indonesian Ocean, the tsunamis killed nearly 228,000 people in 14 countries. With the largest loss of life and massive loss of infrastructure, the Indonesian city of Banda Aceh was particularly hard hit. Subsequent tectonic plate stresses brought about a magnitude 8.7 earthquake on the 28th of March 2005 near Nias Island, compounding the destruction from the tsunami only three months earlier. In between these two events, in early 2005, Rear Admiral Bill McDaniel arrived with the USNS Mercy Hospital ship to assist in the relief effort. This is his story. I'm Ivy Tara Blair, and the book is Faces of the Tsunami. Chapter 5 I sent missives out about every ten days to two weeks to email friends around the world, trying to keep them up somewhat with our progress. However, I sent daily SITREP's situation reports out to the military chain of command above me. Inasmuch as there were multiple levels of reports going to these same individuals from various commands on and off the ship, I felt no need to make my reports dry and didactic, filled with numbers and statistics— I really felt it was important to allow all those folks to understand fully that this was a people endeavor, and statistics, numbers, procedures, and other usual reporting data were the least important of what we were doing. While strongly suspecting that they were more interested in the numbers, and not my stories, we were treating people, interacting with people, saving people, hopefully making new friends. The people involved, both those treating and being treated, were the most important aspects of this effort. I tried to build on each day's sit rep when I wrote the next day's report. I wanted to tell a continuing story of these incredible people we were involved with and report both the successes and failures. Both were important. As I noted earlier, there was some legal consternation initially about what we would have to do if a patient died aboard ship. Lawyers wrung their hands about how we should handle such an event. Well, folks, these people had seen approximately 250,000 of their friends, family, and countrymen die in one fell swoop. They dealt with a continuing war between rebels, GAM, Free Aceh Movement, and the army, with them frequently in the middle as fodder for both sides. They understood death, if nothing else. If someone died, they died. What they were not accustomed to was people being deeply concerned about their welfare and their being and about them as individuals. So day after day, we had ill and injured patients and their families with great trepidation being flown aboard Mercy. Few had ever seen a helicopter, let alone flown in one. Nor a ship the size of Mercy. Nor a ship full of Americans from all heritages, but clearly no one like them. Indeed, foreigners from a country most of them had heard referred to only as the Great Satan. They came aboard scared and confused, hoping that someone might be able to address their problems. And what did they get? Deeply concerned medical, shipboard, and engineering folks all hoping to be able to help them somehow. They got incredibly caring and sympathetic nurses, doctors, corpsmen, and technicians whose sole wish was to make their plight better. They got clean sheets, hot showers, plentiful food. Odd food, which we quickly supplemented with plentiful supplies of rice, the food they understood. And remarkably advanced medical technical help. For many of them, for the first time in their lives, they suddenly perceived that they had value as themselves, as individuals, as someone. 
They got a playroom where they could congregate and talk with each other and where the children quickly learned to draw cute pictures of animals, stylized and fanciful portraits of the ship Mercy, boats, and frequently all too graphic depictions of what had happened to them and what they observed on shore. Of the gigantic tsunami seen from afar. Of the large trucks that gathered the dead and delivered them to mass burial sites. A picture of a ghostly presence rising from a cemetery labeled in Basa, December 26, 2004, the day Banda Ache died. They had the chance to share all of this with each other, and share they did. People who arrived on the ship as strangers became family within hours. The children, injured and ill, smiled constantly and played with each other and with the medical staff, and were adopted immediately as family by all the other smiling Achenese people, as well as the entire staff of Mercy. This closeness, this familyness, if there is such a word, created some interesting situations. Most everyone knows of HIPAA, the law that says each patient deserves total privacy of his medical records and conditions, and that no one else can be privy to that information without written consent, blah, blah, blah. Well, no one had bothered to explain this concept to these people. When the doctors started making their rounds with an interpreter, they tried to do so according to HIPAA regs. That is, they separated the beds that the patients were in so privacy could be maintained, and each conversation with the patient could only be heard by the attending physician, the interpreter, and the affected patient. The problem immediately arose when the patients observed that they had a bed separated by several empty beds from the patient closest to them. How could they talk? How could they share stories of that horrible day? and about the wondrous care they were receiving aboard this giant white ship from these foreigners. So they did the logical thing. They simply moved over several beds until they were within a few feet of each other. This was fine for chatting, but it really screws up things for those concerned with HIPAA and privacy and such. So, from the first day, when the doctor and interpreter would appear, most able-bodied patients and families would fall in immediately behind them as they went about their patient rounds. For a day or two, at most, the doctors tried to get the interpreters to explain to the hangers-on that they needed to converse with their patients in private. The gallery of observers would listen to the explanation with blank looks, then continue to follow the doctors as they went from bed to bed. Now, none of us spoke Basa, so I expect it entirely possible that the interpreters were just saying, ignore these folks in white coats when they attempt to shoo you away, They must not have families where they come from. They'll get frustrated and leave you alone if you just stand there and do nothing. Or something like that. Because what happened was when the patient received bad news, the assembled crowd would gather around them once the doctor had moved on and commiserate or pray, comforting the patient, accomplishing the emotional portion of the healing process far better than our efforts were likely doing. And if the news were good, they would all clap, smile, shake hands, and occasionally cheer, greatly adding to the delight and happiness of the patient receiving the good news. All in all, I think I like their version of HIPAA better than ours. Subject, SITREP 9, February Banda Ache. Today, we decided to add some stress to the patient flow. Fifteen admissions from town with excellent helo and comm support to accomplish this. Most of the patients are surgical, ranging from a hernia to massive tumors of the jaw, fractured mandibles, an open fracture of the radius, fractured femurs, and multiple others. Several surgeries were carried out today, starting out at 0400 this morning when the radiologist and surgeon took the patient we received from the German hospital two days ago into the radiology suite and performed a very sophisticated and delicate procedure to block off an artery in the patient's stomach to stop profuse bleeding. The patient had suddenly bled out, losing about one quarter of his blood volume. Their efforts were successful, but the effects of three prior surgeries before we received him, his chronic pancreatitis and severe infection of his pancreas and other organs almost certainly dictate that he will not survive this. His wife has been counseled, and our staff is working intensely on him and with her. Our other critical patient, the young boy who survived the tsunami and then had severe pneumonia and a respiratory arrest, is still critical. He is holding his own, barely, again with intense treatment by the infectious disease and pulmonary physicians and constant attention from the nursing staff. Our young appendicitis patient, who is the only surviving child of a family wiped out by the tsunami, is doing great. The 14-year-old girl, Machnawia, whose arm we amputated yesterday is doing okay, but will have to have more surgery soon. 
Other surgeries today included two difficult femur fracture repairs and a repair of an open complex fracture of the radius as well as repair of a fractured mandible, jawbone. One of the femur fractures was on an 18-year-old young man who gives a thumbs up and a smile to all of us who have taken part in his treatment. That is a little difficult to do, inasmuch as he has two broken arms and a broken leg from the tsunami, as well as losing his younger sister in that event. A great attitude. A brave young man. He makes us all smile when we work on him, as do most of these incredible folks. I'm not sure how they managed to do this, and I must note that it is humbling to all of us here. 1. 177 patients were seen at University Hospital today. Our efforts there are still somewhat chaotic, inasmuch as it is still a chaotic place, with many moving and unconnected parts. However, with the aid of some extremely dedicated and sharp individuals ashore each day— People like Captain Sheila Norman and Commander Kurt Hummeldorf, as well as many others, our efforts are starting to become more standardized and productive. As noted, 15 patients and 15 escorts were medevac to the ship. We're going to have to hire more interpreters and have some available locally to hire. We will proceed with that immediately. 2. Our outreach teams continue to work on water sanitation with UNICEF and are working on performing some final assessments of the IDP, Internally Displaced Persons, Camps, and Aceh. They visited with a water engineer from France looking at a water distribution system. The French desire lab support for their water analyses. 3. The mental health team has their agenda outlined for the remainder of our time here. They also met with UNICEF personnel— and are working on infrastructure development of program nodules to facilitate and renew mental care capacity for Ache. There is a tremendous and unique opportunity for us here in this capacity. 4. We continue to receive multiple requests for more tours of mercy and for overnight stays for worn-out NGO personnel. As soon as we accomplish the transition to CTF-73, new command structure in charge of our effort, we will start working on these issues. 5. We continue to supply oxygen to support the operating room and emergency rooms at University Hospital. We have 10 bottles to exchange tomorrow. The engineer's and medical technician's reputation for wizardry at repairs are resulting in steadily increasing requests for assistance. They continue to rebuild motors, pumps, air conditioning units, refrigerators, electrical systems, etc. The ICRC hospital, run by the Norwegians, has requested that they come and help repair their X-ray unit. 6. I met with Dr. Russ today along with Dr. Harold Timbo and Dr. Larry Ronan. Dr. Timbo and Dr. Ronan made proposals to Dr. Russ, which he immediately accepted. Project Hope donors will work with the pulmonologist to build a state-of-the-art pulmonary disease ward, concentrating on TB, which is endemic here. They hope to complete this task before Mercy departs the area. In addition, discussions were started to allow Harvard professors to come here for teaching purposes. Dr. Russ simplified the procedures for allowing us to bring patients to Mercy for care, a task that is sometimes not easily accomplished under these circumstances. 7. Tomorrow we will send a 10-person maternal child team to Lemno. General Bambang, the senior TNI person in the district, will come to the ship for a visit, along with the Surgeon General and other members of the Ministry of Health. German helos may be available to start ferrying people and equipment to Mercy. They will work with Mercy tomorrow to accomplish this. We are sending 20 people to University Hospital tomorrow to assist in care. We are looking forward to the possibility of being allowed overnight stays there, inasmuch as this will greatly simplify lift requirements— and will allow greater flexibility to help out there. We have 31 patients in the hospital now, and with the volume of surgery steadily going up, probably will max out at about 40. We will continue to try to discharge patients in a timely manner. However, if this trend continues to go up, we may need increased number of nurses and corpsmen. In addition, if the flight schedule increases, consideration must be given to augmenting the flight deck crew. We are doing what we came here to do. W.J. McDaniel. Subject, SITREP, 11 February, Banda Aceh. Our little pneumonia patient, who was found clinging to driftwood two kilometers at sea, continues to hold his own. While still critical, his blood studies are looking much better at this time. The staff have sort of adopted him as a symbol. After going through what he has gone through, he should live. 
He frequently has not only a nurse at his side all night, but one of our pediatricians or infectious disease doctors as well. His lungs sound clearer now, and they will attempt to wean him off the respirator this weekend. The other children have definitely come out of their reserve shells and are like children everywhere, playing, laughing, and having fun. Our four-year-old burn patient, who has straight legs for the first time in a long time, insisted on being alone in the playroom for a while this evening so he could draw a picture for his favorite nurse. We had VIP visitors from the Ministry of Health in Jakarta today, as well as a senior member of IOM and three personnel from Geneva representing WHO. They left after a good lunch and a tour of the facility, including the Minister of Health member talking with every patient in the hospital. There are over 40 at this time. She told me, they like it here. Everyone is so nice. We discussed some proposed projects with the IOM physician and the WHO personnel and will seek approval for those projects. We talked at length with them about our desire to not create a dependency on Mercy in Banda Aceh, but to work with them to quickly bring their facility up to the point where they can assume the care we are currently giving. They agreed with that concept. EPMU6 presented their CONOPS plan to the leadership today. 1. We admitted six patients today, a mix of major orthopedic problems, tumors, and urological problems. We also brought four patients from shore to do cataract surgery. We discharged three patients. 2. 99 patients were seen ashore. Dental again extracted considerably more teeth than they had patients. 3. Pharmacy inventoried and categorized over 700 boxes of medications today. The shelving they ordered has come in, and they found other shelving covered with mud. After a good cleaning, it was serviceable. 4. Biomed worked on two x-ray machines all day. 5. Project Hope personnel met with the head of pulmonology today, and she presented the list of equipment she needs for a state-of-the-art facility. Dr. Larry Ronan feels that the list is reasonable and will proceed back to the States this week to try to purchase the items. Agreement was reached on modifications and repairs to the existing facility she uses. She will have a state-of-the-art pulmonary center complete with isolation rooms for TB cases. 6. Dr. Russ, director of Abedin University Hospital, wants to come to the ship for a visit as soon as he can arrange it. 7. All are hoping our CT scanner is repaired tomorrow when the technician gets here. There is a real need for its capabilities. 8. A team went to Lamno, a town an hour or so away, today, and worked with the NGOs and Pakistani hospital there. The OBGYN doctor saw 12 consults and arranged to meet with 20 midwives next Tuesday for discussions and examination of patients. Three psych consults were done in conjunction with local psychiatrists. Arrangements were made for dental, ophthalmology, and urology clinics to be held soon. 9. There were 10 surgeries scheduled today, and a heavy load is anticipated tomorrow. All in all, we are proceeding on schedule. Embassy personnel are aboard this evening attempting to guide us through the intricacies of local politics. After a long explanation from them, I have developed a headache. I am going to Jakarta tomorrow to meet with embassy personnel and NGOs there, returning to the ship on Tuesday. W.J. McDaniel He suggested that he could make a call or two and get the ship turned around, aimed at the west coast of the United States instead of coming out and making his life more complicated. I had listened to his objections and complaints in silence, then finally tried a different line of reasoning. Colonel let me try a straightforward explanation for our presence. First, the President, of the United States, that is, decreed immediately after the tsunami struck that we would deploy our state-of-the-art hospital ship to assist. The Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of the Navy immediately agreed that course of action was desirous, and soon thereafter, the Chief of Naval Operations agreed with their thinking. The senior four-star admiral in the Pacific was placed in all-over charge of the operation and was the person in charge of deployment and operation of the ship. He was the person who hired me. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think it is a career-enhancing move for you to tell all of these rather distinguished gentlemen that their idea is dumber than dirt? Do you really see yourself winning that argument? Now, he did not achieve his rank and current position by being totally dense— he grudgingly conceded the logic of my argument, but was not happy. In the three weeks or so since I had visited with him in Jakarta, he had continued to make snide comments and varying communiques to the ship and up and down the chain of command. 
On about 8 February, he sent out a rather stupid message disparaging the wisdom of what we were doing, the effectiveness of our efforts, and several other observations in the same vein. I had had enough of his BS. We had a hard enough task to accomplish without having to listen to guff from our own personnel. I sent the embassy an email stating that I was coming back to Jakarta and rather badly wished to chat with him. Clearly, we had a failure to communicate. So, Dr. Ann Peterson and I departed Mercy and flew to Jakarta. I was met in the hotel there by his assistant, who informed me that everything was all hunky-dory. The colonel now understood what we were trying to do. I subsequently discovered that the Marine Three Star in overall charge of the U.S. relief efforts in the exercise had met with the colonel in a closed-door session for an hour or so. It seemed that no further discussions were needed. I actually never heard from that officer again and certainly had no desire to have dinner or invite him for a game of bridge. Anne and I made rounds again in Jakarta, visiting with and getting help from the embassy staff and U.S. aid personnel. After several days, we returned to Mercy. Once back aboard, the Commodore came to see me. I was told that I needed to call the four-star admiral in Hawaii. I did so. Where have you been? I told him. Why haven't you been sending in your situation reports? Well, I had no situation to report. I had been in Jakarta, out of touch with the daily activities aboard Mercy. Bill, I'm not going to bore you with the identity of the senior folks who are reading those reports. You left us all hanging. What has happened to Iqbal? To the little girl whose arm you cut off? To all the others? What's their status? You just cut off in mid-sentence and left everyone with no follow-up. Don't do that. I laughed. I really had thought that perhaps, because my reports were in real language and not military jargon, I might have just been irritating those folks who read them, if they read them at all. It seemed that they were interested in the details, the human details, after all. We discussed my further role in the effort. At that point, I had accomplished what I had been sent out to do, that is, get all the approval needed to allow Mercy to work toward a successful conclusion and find patience to be seen. I asked him if he thought I needed to stick around any longer. There was a long silence. I think you should stay there. First, those daily reports, those human stories, need to keep flowing. And, more importantly, there are still all manners of things that we can't foresee that might come up. You work for me and are on the ground there. Make sure those surprises that come up don't mess up what we are accomplishing there. So, yes, if you don't mind, stick around until the end of the mission. Obviously, I agreed with his reasoning. I was in the early stages of involvement of one of the most meaningful things I had ever done, and one that would affect my life, and almost everyone involved as well, more profoundly than we could ever imagine. Subject. Sitrep, Banda Aceh, 16 February. I returned from Jakarta today eager to find out what is happening new on Mercy. Well, lots. Patient flow continues at a high rate. We have seen over 1,000 outpatients and have done over 50 major surgeries since arriving. And perhaps more important for the long haul, we have provided outstanding infrastructure building support for Abedin Hospital and other areas of Banda Aceh. But first, Iqbal. Iqbal is the young pneumonia patient who was found clinging to driftwood two kilometers at sea after the tsunami. When I left here Saturday, he was still on a respirator and was totally non-reactive. Today... I entered to find him wide awake, breathing normally, bright-eyed, and smiling. Literally encased in a pile of stuffed toys. He watched Spider-Man last night and is now a big fan. He walked across ITU today and went up on deck in a wheelchair with a big smile and big sunglasses on. He is a survivor. And, as you might imagine, after having lived on tube feeding for the last several weeks, he has a ravenous appetite. He and his uncle are stars on our ship. Our appendicitis patient has gone home with his father, the only member of his family other than him who survived the tsunami. Both were happy people when they left, but perhaps no happier than our staff who cared for them. My young barber, who I visited professionally, from a barber standpoint, three weeks ago, was operated upon Monday, and now has stable legs of equal length. He was most happy to see me, though he was looking rather critically at my ever-lengthening hair. And, not to make anyone squirm, a baseball-sized stone was removed from an 18-year-old fellow's bladder. No one here has ever seen one that size. Our 11-year-old with a chest tumor, Jabal, has been diagnosed with a neurofibroma, a non-malignant tumor, but one which must come out. 
Mass General has offered to fly his father and him there free of charge for this complex surgery, but he will be evaluated tomorrow in Jakarta first. By the way, the general consensus of the Indonesian workers is that the USA MREs are better than anyone else's. 1. We had five admissions today, and the hospital census is 38, with seven in the intensive care unit. One of those is a young seven-year-old girl similar to Iqbal, severe lung disease after being swept out to sea in the tsunami and inhaling lots of water. She has bilateral chest tubes in place at this time and is in very serious condition. There were a total of nine surgeries today, including six cataracts. 165 outpatients were seen, again with optometry, ophthalmology, and dentists seeing the vast majority. 2. We have two TNI physicians living on board now, greatly facilitating communications. Starting Monday, one of our physicians will start working in the TNI hospital each day. 3. Indonesian doctors continue to trickle back into Abedin Hospital with three Indonesian surgeons returning today. They plan on resuming care immediately. Several Malaysian physicians will start working there soon as well. When surgical cases are contemplated for mercy from this point on, one of the Indonesian surgeons will sign for the patient and will hold them at Abedin if they can do the surgery. This is all part of our exit strategy as we slowly back away while their capabilities increase. 4. Our outreach teams visited the county health clinic today. We are doing assessments there and will help them procure a new steam sterilizer from IOM. They visited an IDP, Internally Displaced Persons, camp with 1,400 people in it. Interestingly enough, all those people came from the same village, and the population of the village was 2,800 on the day of the tsunami. The 1,400 survivors walked 13 hours to get to Banda Aceh. Again, our team was doing assessments of conditions and found a number to report to IOM, International Organization for Migration, for repairs. The mental health team worked alongside UNICEF psychosocial team today. They will start an intensive course tomorrow reconstituting the mental health capabilities of the local mental health populace. 5. Engineering and biomed repair has been extremely busy. They got the aeration pumps running at the water treatment facility today. They are in the process of trying to locate a pump for the facility and will repair it if possible. They bought air conditioners and refrigerators for the pulmonary ward and installed new windows, lights, and screens. They managed to trace down the problems and repair the electrical grid, giving power to four or five new buildings in Abedin Hospital today. There was a possibility they would need to dig up 900 meters of cable and replace it, but managed to trace the problem down and avoid this. In addition, they went to the internet and found tech manuals for the air conditioners in several wards today, managing to repair six of them. The patients on one of the wards all gave them a big round of applause. 6. The Lamno, a town about 45 miles away, group, brought a 25-year-old, a 24-week pregnant woman, back to the ship. She has been having fevers since the tsunami and needs an extensive workup. Tomorrow will be a little lighter day. We have four major admissions planned, and with seven patients in the ICU are about maxed out. We have several other surgeries we will avoid admitting until Saturday. Friday is a no-fly day, and we'll be spent doing surgeries and working on the patients we have. Saturday, Dr. Vindenwerder, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, will be here all afternoon, making it a short day. Fourteen journalists will arrive Saturday also. Sunday we will stand by in case POTUS, Presidents Clinton and Bush, drop by. No one seems sure if this will happen. Monday, 15 congressional staffers are coming, though no one on the ship is sure who they are. We may be unable to accommodate all their desires for lift, inasmuch as patient care does need to fit in here somewhere. We have a CODL, Congressional Delegation Group, arriving on Thursday. I will see no major let-up in business in the near future. There is a question as to whether or not we will be allowed to go anywhere on the West Coast other than here. Mark Llewellyn, commanding officer of the hospital aboard Mercy, and I are going to sit down with Dr. Russ on Saturday and plan a timeline on an exit strategy. If he wants to hold us to our original timeline of 19 March, we will be hard-pressed to pull out much sooner. If not, that will not be a problem. I met the Indonesian Minister of Health on the plane from Jakarta today and talked with her. She expressed a very sincere, gracious thanks for Mercy's presence. I continue to think the staff of Mercy has done an outstanding job. I hear praise from multiple levels as I travel about and have had two expats tell me, Mercy makes me proud to be an American. 
The staff has managed to do this with considerable restrictions in place, such as the inability to remain on shore at night. While rumors are around about possible security problems, there have been no incidents at all. We have followed the mandates dictated by GOI, Government of Indonesia, and TNI, Indonesian Army, to the letter with nothing but positive results. Bill McDaniel I noted in this sitrep the return of some of the local host nation physicians. There was a real problem getting medical personnel back. First, about one-third of them had died in the tsunami. Then the Indonesian government decreed that all medical care given would be free of charge. That's fine and dandy and seems to make sense. But unfortunately, the host nation medical personnel at Abedin Hospital did not receive wages. The hospital was paid directly as they saw patients ordinarily and then paid wages to the doctors and nurses. With no income coming in by government decree, any returning medical personnel were forced to work without pay. And most of them had lost part or all of their families and homes. Many of them left that part of Indonesia to live elsewhere with relatives and friends and practice medicine in an area where they could be paid for their efforts. I sat down with Dr. Russ and discussed this problem with him. I asked him how much money it would take per month to pay his staff. He thought about it and came up with a figure of about 100000 a month needed. I told him I thought I might be able to get donations for that amount until they could start charging again. When I said I would try to get him the money, he asked me to not give any to him or to the hospital. Any income they received had to be turned over to the Central Health Ministry in Jakarta, with them in turn dispensing it back to the hospital what funds were needed. He said if I turned over 100000 grand to him, he would be lucky to receive one-tenth of that in return. He asked if it would be possible for us to set up an independent money dispersing site. He would give us the names of the medical personnel and the amount of wages they should receive, and we would hand the money out. That way, no money would need to be passed on to Jakarta. This did present somewhat of a problem. Who could I find to act as a dispersing agent, and how much would they charge for the effort? And frankly, who did I trust not to help themselves to some pocket change from the funds? As I thought about this problem, I went on my daily rounds to UN and NGO agencies I visited routinely. While sitting with the head of the UNICEF effort, an incredibly sharp woman, I asked her if she had any ideas about my problem. How much money are you trying to raise? I told her. She shook her head and laughed. Admiral, I have more millions of dollars than I know how to spend here. We could fund your effort with absolutely no problem, and the dispersing of funds could easily be done by my accounting folks. Will this help? Well, in a word, yes. So Abedin Hospital started getting some badly needed medical help back, but slowly, slowly. I mentioned in this set rep our Lamno group. These were all female physicians and midwives sent to Lamno to run an OBGYN clinic. While in an emergency, male physicians could see anyone, for routine care, the Muslim faith really, I mean really, preferred only females examining females. We luckily had a good group of nurse practitioners, midwives, and outstanding female physicians to accomplish this task. Subject, Sitrep, Banda Aceh, 18 February. This was a no-fly day, and the staff appreciated the rest. All except the ward personnel and operating room personnel got to stand down. A few statistics to wrap up for two weeks' work thus far. 284 teeth have been pulled. 660 x-rays have been taken, most of which are abnormal. A considerable number of them represent pathology which none of the staff on Mercy has ever seen before, some amazing cases. Over 1,000 lab studies have been done, as well as 1,600 prescriptions being filled. There have been 78 surgeries, most of which have been major. Five of those cases were done today. We have seen well in excess of 1,000 patients. About 1,000 pairs of glasses have been fitted. Finally, the effect of the infrastructure support we have given to Banda Aceh and to Abedin Hospital is almost impossible to accurately calculate. We are providing maternal child support, mental health support, water and sanitation evaluations, immunization teams to work with UNICEF, medical tech support, incredible engineering support, machine shop utilization to clean and rewire all kinds of engines and pumps, and miscellaneous support activities to multiple NGOs and UN activities. Regarding onboard patients, most continue to improve. No new patients were added in as much as this was a no-fly day. Betwin, the little seven-year-old with big eyes, continues to be quite ill and still has both chest tubes in place. 
Interestingly enough, her father, who is accompanying her, was coughing. We x-rayed him, and now he is under treatment for pneumonia. Mudassir, the barber, is improving steadily, though he has expressed a desire to stay aboard Mercy just a little longer. A common desire. Iqbal, our miracle pneumonia save, is eating like a horse, according to the staff. As I noted earlier, all the children appear malnourished. Iqbal is trying to remedy that in a few short days. He walked outside today and will probably be going home early in the week. Our 14-year-old with bone cancer and amputation of her arm had CT scans today. The radiologist biopsied two nodes to see if they represent metastases. Harvard is considering bringing her there for chemotherapy, depending on the results of the ongoing studies. Our last patient is a 9-year-old girl with advanced glaucoma and bilateral cataracts. She was brought in yesterday in severe pain and today had both cataracts removed. While this solved her pain problem, the question now is whether or not she will be able to see tomorrow when her bandages are removed. Glaucoma, greatly increased pressure inside the eyeball, will cause atrophy of the optic nerve if it is too high for too long. Her pressure was markedly elevated. The question unanswered at this point is whether or not it has been there too long. If so, she will have no vision at all. We won't know until her bandages are removed. Tomorrow is a busy day. Almost 50 personnel are going ashore in a myriad of activities. Captain Llewellyn, Dr. Timbo, and I are going to visit with Dr. Russ to discuss our suggested activities for the next four weeks. We will then return to Mercy to await the arrival of the Assistant Secretary of Defense, Health Affairs, Bill McDaniel. My barber, whom I had met well before the arrival of Mercy and who you might remember had a horrible limp secondary to an old, unhealed fracture of the femur, was a delightful addition to the festivities aboard ship. And there were festivities. The patients and staff interacted all the time, and there was always laughter on the wards, regardless of the seriousness of any patient injuries or illnesses. They were delighted to be there, and for most of them this was the first medical treatment they had ever received. The Indonesian patients immediately became family to each other, sitting with each other, talking, visiting, caring for the children, and interacting, without a common language, remarkably with the hospital staff. The staff, military and civilian alike, seemed to thrive on the work and the interactions as well, though it seems that we suffered our losses and failures far more grievously than the patients did. They had come to expect the worst and live with it. We never quite achieved that degree of acceptance. Any patient who could do so performed if they could. My barber turned out to be an accomplished guitarist, and sitting in his wheelchair on deck would play and sing to a very attentive and appreciative audience. Mat Naiwa, our delightful and beautiful 14-year-old with osteosarcoma of the radius and on whom we had done a below-elbow amputation, quickly became the organizer of all the other kids. Games, drawing competitions, the results of which were hung on display in the playroom we had converted from a storage room, singing. She just constantly smiled and encouraged the other kids to do the same. Fadil, our little four-year-old who had come in with old burns and severe flexion contractures of his knees and who had never walked, learned quickly when his contractures were released and his knees straightened. He had to hang on to something to walk and delighted in the wheels and the portable EKG machine. They allowed him great mobility and man was he mobile. He would take off in a charge to run the machine into nurses and doctors, laughing all the while as they laughed back at him. All in all, a happy ship. 19 February 2005 We have been seeing patients actively for only two weeks now, but it feels like so much longer. For me, it has been over four weeks, so maybe there's a reason it seems considerably longer. Project Hope personnel start rotating out next week, and I will follow them soon after that. My job was to prepare the way and do the political and personal things that it took to get us accepted and enable us to see patients. As noted before, I did not leave per the request of the admiral who had hired me. We are there. I think everyone is getting so involved in their patients that it is going to be hard to let go. I can give an ironclad promise that everyone will remember them. You need to know Eliza, a 17-year-old who looks about 12, who was in the ocean with her mother for more than a day before she was rescued. Her mother died, but Eliza has survived and has suffered the same malady that so many have suffered, tsunami lung, terrible infections, and pneumonia. In Elisa's case, she became hemiplegic, paralyzed on her left side. When she came to Mercy, she was miserable and withdrawn, and on CT scan, a large brain abscess was found. She was started on aggressive IV antibiotic treatment and is responding slowly, even occasionally smiling now. 
Tonight, the psychiatrist gave a lecture to the medical group on the grief process, relating it to the victims of the tsunami. It is possible that we might need to take that lecture a little more personally, however. After the lecture, a Project Hope emergency physician, versed in dealing with trauma and sick patients, stood up to make a comment about Eliza and her father's belief that her paralysis is because she has internalized her grief from her mother dying beside her. In other words, a conversion reaction. The room remained dead silent until he managed to take a few breaths and finally finish his story. No embarrassment in the room, however. Everyone in the room and everyone on the ship who has dealt with these patients has felt the same way. No one will leave here untouched. Our work continues the same as I have noted before. Lots of patients. Some of the most abnormal x-rays in the world. Tremendous strides in helping repair the infrastructure of Banda Aceh, including water and sanitation teams, engineering teams, immunization teams, mental health delivery, provision of oxygen to several hospitals when needed, even delivery of a large bucket of ice cream to the Aussies, who work their butts off and are great friends to us. We took five pizzas into the university hospital today for the emergency room and operating room personnel. They loved it. This is the most amazing pulling together of many countries working alongside each other that it has ever been my privilege to be part of. But there is always a bottom denominator which colors our perceptions of everything. The Achenese people. Unfailing politeness, courage, resilience, good humor, grace. What a delightful people. We are here to give them support, and I'm not sure who is getting more out of this exchange, them or us. We have had many patients here, but perhaps none more symbolic than Iqbal, an 11-year-old who was found clinging to a piece of driftwood two kilometers out in the ocean many hours after the event. All of his immediate family had died, and his uncle found him five days later in a camp. Iqbal also suffered from tsunami lug and slowly worsened. We got him about two weeks ago when he suffered a respiratory arrest at University Hospital. One of our helos was on the pad there, turning, and we got him on a respirator on Mercy within an hour. He was totally unresponsive, had a white cell count of 80,000, had white lungs on x-ray. The infectious disease and pediatric doctors started working on him, with a doctor and a nurse staying by his side 24 hours a day. He was about the size of a five-year-old. We would all tiptoe in and look at him, waiting for something. If anyone deserved to survive this, he did. Well, Iqbal was taken off the respirator one week ago, and today proudly sits in his bed in the middle of a pile of stuffed animals, smiling and watching Spider-Man videos. He only quits smiling when he eats, which is frequently. He is trying to gain all those lost pounds back as quickly as he can. Iqbal is a survivor and represents all that is good about these people here to us. Finally, a patient told one of our doctors at Abedin Hospital through an interpreter, We are a very strong people. We take time to look ahead. We find time every day to laugh and some time to remember. Those of us who survive must live our lives. And we will be okay. I think they will. Bill. Bill.